everybody, I'm Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust and I'm really excited to be at the Greensboro History Museum here in Greensboro, North Carolina. We're joined today by John Zachman, who's one of the curators at the museum, and we're seeing the Dr. John and Isabella Murphy Confederate Long Arms Collection, which is a fantastic collection of artifacts that's housed here at the Greensboro History Museum. We encourage you to come out here to see all kinds of facets of Greensboro's history. Uh, the, the museum itself is, is fabulous, uh, and John can talk a little bit more about that, but you can also head over to their website and see when the museum's open and see what they have on display. But John, uh, before we really dive into all of the awesome artifacts you've pulled out for us, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Dr. Murphy and his wife? Absolutely. So, um, well, first of all, thanks, Chris, for coming to visit us and um, take an interest in our, in our collection here. I know that uh, a lot of folks know about the collection and are excited about it as we are. Um, so Dr. Murphy was a psychiatrist and um, followed in the footsteps of his father actually, but grew up in Virginia and heard stories about his Confederate ancestors, sparked an interest in collecting, and then in his adulthood, really assembled this you know, remarkable collection of Confederate long arms and um, some 150 or so weapons. He was very active in the Sons of Confederate Veterans and other related organizations. He was also very active in the um, American Society of Arms Collectors. And he also was, um, you know, a, a, was a scholar in, in many ways. He wrote articles and then eventually published two books um, that are really a, a significant part of his legacy in terms of the research that he and Howard Mattis did on, on Confederate long arms, rifles, muskets, and musketoons. Yeah, and it's amazing. You, you've pulled out some things here and, you know, we can see uh, John and Isabel here. Uh, we can see him actually sitting in his study uh, with part of the collection right behind him. He's reading uh, one of the gun reports. And then you can also see, uh, you know, two of the uh, gun reports he wrote for as well as uh, two of his books. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that you said he's not just a collector. He's a scholar. And I think a lot of people um, forget that the collectors actually, in many ways, are scholars. Even if they haven't written for a scholarly journal, haven't written a book themselves, they do a lot of research into these arms. Uh, and what's great about them, we, we get a lot of lineage with them. We might know who carried these weapons. We might know who manufactured them, uh, meaning all the way down to the person themselves. And, and you have some great stories you've already been sharing with us. So let's take a look at, at a few of the long arms you pulled out for us. What are we looking at right in front of you? So right in front of me are three examples of Fayetteville Armory rifles. And as you said, you know, Dr. Murphy was a very discerning collector. He only collected pieces that were pristine condition, that were complete more or less not damaged, um, no replacement parts, nothing of that nature. And also he, you know, the, the provenance was important to him as well, making sure they were well documented. So one of the strengths of his collection, besides those sort of criteria, was that he also collected multiple examples of pieces made over time. And so the difference between these rifles, so we know Fayetteville Armory, um, uh, you know, a lot of the machinery uh, that was at Harper's Ferry came down, right? And then was used at Fayetteville to um, manufacture I don't know, between eight and 10,000 rifles for Confederate soldiers <clears throat> in the Carolinas and elsewhere. So this first piece is, is uh, an earlier one and it's a so-called type one. And I'm not gonna get too much into all the technical details, but part of this typology of, of weapons is, is based on the changes that have occurred over time, especially with regard to this high hump. If you look at the lock mechanism and the lock plate, you can see there are very distinct differences between um, what's here considered a type one, this is considered a type two, and this is considered, has elements of type two and three. Um, and, uh, and so that kind of comparative study is really what a lot of the researchers and scholars get into, really digging down into the minutia of, of the, you know, the number of um, markings or the different uh, numbers of screws or locations of the, you know, various pieces and bands, et cetera. So those are, um, so this is, like I said, so these are three examples. And then we have some later ones, meaning some type fours that were made later in 1863 and 1864 that were, that are on exhibit right now. But so that's just one example where you can see multiple um, pieces made by the same or at the same location. So, so Fayetteville is an armory that'll be 
producing Confederate arms all the way up through the late war. Um, it's, it's finally captured March 12th of 1865 by the first uh, Michigan engineers who actually destroyed Fayetteville. But as, uh, um, as John said, you know, this is a lot of equipment brought down from Harper's Ferry, which was an arsenal in Virginia at the time, today West Virginia. And this is what's going to help to produce some of these Confederate arms. A lot of folks think that the Confederacy only purchased arms from abroad or stole from what they could from battlefields or from Yankee depots. But they have a great collection here in Greensboro showing us uh, that they've actually produced them. Now, what's interesting about the, these rifles that you've chosen, um, most people who see a Civil War uh, musket or a rifle, they usually have three bands. Uh -huh. Notice I don't have gloves on, but I'm not touching them. So everyone always comments about that. We have the two different bands. Uh, they're made out of brass, a lot of brass on these guns. We also have for the, the bayonet lock, these would be able to uh, have a saber bayonet on the end of these things because they have the side uh, attachment for it rather than going around the sight for those socket bayonets. The socket bayonet goes over the end of the gun and then locks into place. That allows you to still fire uh, your musket. Uh, this might seem a little bit silly, but before this, we had plug bayonets where you would legitimately just plug a bayonet into the end of the gun and you couldn't fire anymore. Then it turns into a large, long pike or a spear. Yeah. Um, we also have the elevated sights, it looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have the, the range on this. And then we have you know some beautiful stocks. Can you tell us the difference between uh, the type one stock and the type two stock? I see that we have this little brass compartment back there. What's that for? Oh, you're talking about the patch box here? Absolutely. Yeah, so these earlier pieces have this patch box, which was fairly common and used to store, um, you know, patches, other things that would be used in terms of um, ignition for, you know, for getting the, um, the weapon to expel the, the ammunition. And so we've gradually kind of moved away from that between the Type 1 and 2. Um, also, on this one, you can see Fayetteville, if, if, you, if you're lucky, um, well, some of these details are worn and not as easily seen. And I, I think that's about all you can make out on the plate here. As we get into the later pieces, you can actually see the date. So here we see 1862. Um, we also see Fayetteville. And then we see this eagle um, over, I think it's over CSA. That's, that's right, yeah. Okay, a couple other questions. Number one, is this an original uh, strap for it that uh, you have here? It's hard to say if it's original to this weapon. Um, like I said earlier, I think Dr. Murphy was especially keen on purchasing things that were intact and didn't have replacement or other. So I, I'm fairly confident that it's period. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reasonably confident that it's original to this piece, but I can't be 100% certain about that. That kind of information is not recorded in his notes um, for, for you know, that level of detail for some of these pieces. Similarly with some of the ramrods and some of the other accessories that were removable. But I'm, I'm, because of his sort of strict criteria and discipline in collecting, I'm pretty certain that, you know, he wouldn't have taken things or he would have gotten rid of it if it wasn't appropriate or wasn't original to the piece itself. And I'm thinking sling. I couldn't come up with the term at the time. Sling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, uh... Some of them you'll see, you know, a lot of them are missing, obviously, because they're so mm -hmm. uh, fragile and just through use and whatever they, you know, don't survive. But, you know, you know we do have examples that do have the slings and, and many that don't. It just... Uh, sit one up for us. So yeah, get a sense of the height of this. Yeah. Uh, so you know the great thing about this weapon, you know, this is uh, a considered a long arm. Absolutely, it's very similar to what we would consider a Mississippi rifle. Would have that look. Um, so we have the the brass on the outside. A lot of the spring fields that you would see carried by the Union would have uh, would not be using brass this time. The end fields would be using those. Uh, we have a brass trigger guard, but very similar uh, style because they are using Union machinery or United States machinery that they've captured, brought down to here. Percussion weapons, uh, early war, sometimes you would see flintlocks still being carried by the Confederates. So this is a, a great representation of some of the very limited uh, industrial capacity that the Confederacy has. So they're actually down here producing these arms. We'll take a look at a few other items that we have here at the Greensboro History Museum. We switched out what we are looking at now and we have a new batch of small arms that we can explore and examine. And it's, it's an amazing juxtaposition. Uh, if you've seen what was produced at Fayetteville, we're gonna move across the Southern Confederacy, across the Deep South, and we're gonna take a look at some uh, weapons produced in New Orleans, is that yes, correct? Yes, New Orleans and later Athens, Georgia. In Athens, Georgia and New Orleans. So, John, what do we have here? And 
I think I, I made the comment, this looks like a hot mess of a gun. So <laughs> I think you didn't make that comment. <laughs> yeah. uh, what we have here are examples of Cook and Brother. I think it was Francis and Ferdinand Cook who um, came together and, uh, and uh, started a you know, weapons manufacturing first in the New Orleans area. And that was in the 1861, 1862 time period. And then of course they had to flee with the uh, fall of New Orleans and uh, were managed to shuffle, uh, I guess, most of their equipment to the Athens, Georgia area and then resume production the last two years of the war. So these are in chronological order, uh, starting with this first one here. And this would be an 1861 example. I believe, yeah, it's it says Cook and Brothers, or Cook and Brother, excuse me, uh, maybe it says New Orleans, or maybe it just says NO, I'm not sure. NO. NO, okay, and then just the date, 1861. Um, and so you can see this has um, got its two bands as well. It's missing the sling. Um, again, it's got a patch box uh, as the pieces that we earlier looked at. Oh, and also it's got this flag. I forgot to mention the, yeah, flag, the flag here outside of the lock. So what's interesting about this this piece, and as we, we'll work, make our way up through here, and I was just joking, calling it a hot mess, it's actually really cool because what we're seeing is the evolution of con the Confederacy or the de-evolution of the Confederacy as they're hodgepodging and, and patching together what they can to make their manufacture of arms. Um, so, you know, looking at this first piece here, we see an elevated site, which is reminiscent of an Enfield. Mm -hmm. We see over here where the cone is of the gun, we don't see a side screw. Now that's a side screw is indicative of an 1861 Springfield where you can take the screw out of the side. It's actually easier to clean. 63 Springfields, which are a lighter uh, rifle, uh, will actually have that smoothed in there. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see what you're ha you have here. If you move your way up the, the gun here, Gary, you'll notice we still have the brass. Uh, we have the brass imp impedimentia on it, but uh, not using the right words right now. But we have the, the stamped on the side. Um, socket where you could put the socket band that this will be the attachment for it but if you look at the site it's a very very rudimentary site on the end but when it stands out it's actually going to be a different color so this will be easier to fire down range and so this will be able to make this out when you see the elevated site back here look down range and it'll be a little bit easier if you're actually firing on a target uh, so that's a that's an interesting piece here as we move our way up the guns, you'll you'll see the evolution, or as I said, the evolution of these sights. Uh, they become more rudimentary, especially the rear sight uh, on these guns. We'll still see the very similar sight at the end of the gun, but we have this rudimentary one here. John, this is an 1862. Are we still in yes. New Orleans? Yeah, we're we still in New Orleans, down? and I think the plate, the lock plate's similar in its um, markings with the flag, and then the Cook and Brother. Uh, N O and the year, and then maybe a serial number as well. And, and the other interesting point, as we look here, when John picks up the next one, the hammer is going to start to change. We have three different almost style hammers on these these guns, um, and you do have hammer molds whenever you're making these different hammers, but they all look just a little bit different. Uh, the sights will remain the same, at least the rear sights on the sixty uh, two and sixty three. Uh, but that, that that's interesting. It seems down here where the uh, bayonet attachment is, it seems like they just came up with um, mm -hmm. anything that they could. This is actually screwed on. I've never seen this in person where they've actually screwed that uh, onto the end where you can attach your, your bayonet. So it's removable instead of welded on there. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really neat. Yeah. You couldn't use the sights to, for the socket bayonet for sure. And I think um, this is also, um, I don't know if you saw the detail of this. I think it's also at this, uh, Part of the barrel here, it's also marked. Can you make that out? Oh yeah, very well. Now it says number 1869 there. For people that don't know, what is that? Uh, I believe that would be the serial number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what you, it, it, collectors, especially Dr. Murphy, would be looking for guns with matching serial numbers on them when possible. Uh, that would mean that the gun was uh, the same. Uh, you can find matching serial numbers. It's kind of like matching serial numbers on a car. Um, whenever you want to have an older antique car, my father's a big antique car enthusiast. 
Matching numbers, that's what you want, and you want these on your guns as well. Just to be clear, matching what to what? Could you explain that? Um, you would have the matching gun parts. So you would have sometimes the serial numbers, uh, which would come on the end or the, the breech of the gun. Sometimes you would find them, depending on the manufacturer, you could find serial numbers on the butt plate, which is much more rare. You'd also find it on the, uh, the lock of the gun. Uh, so you would want to have the same lock, the same barrel, uh, the lock, stock, and barrel, the old old way of saying it. That's um, one fun way of, of putting it. But that's what you would look for uh, on the guns if they had more than one number on them. All right. So then this next one, I think we've left New Orleans and headed to, to Atlanta, Georgia. And yeah, so this one is a 1863 model. Does the lock have the same, lock plate have the same features? It has the flag. the flag. Can't see it as close up. There we go. Athens, Georgia. It just looks a tiny bit different in in writing, in stamping. When we move from 1861 and 2 mm -hmm. to 63 and 64, we have different ramrod styles. Mm -hmm. It's got the grooved uh, end. This is smooth. Or this tulip style. I don't know how this referred to. And so we have, this is more... You know, if, you, if you're more of the common collector, um, that you're going to see these on Enfields most likely. That's what the Enfield style looks more like. And then, as John pointed out, this is a Tulip. Uh, Tulip is, uh, looks closer to the Springfield model, the U.S. Springfield model that you would see, just to kind of give you some common ground. Now, now, John, we have four beautiful pieces here. You know, and Dr. Murphy's collected a lot through the years. You know, you mentioned that he's an award-winning collector, and I can see why. These are an amazing, just one very small portion of his collection. Can you tell us a little bit about the awards that he, he won over the years? Yeah, I think, um, well, this takes us back to the um, his membership in the um, American Society of Arms Collectors, which is a fairly prestigious group of collectors um, that, you know, focus on all kinds of different materials, not just Civil War. Um, and so they meet twice a year, and he was active for 30 plus years in this organization. And uh, what you can see in front of me are some of the, um, the medals and some of the awards that he won at different times. Um, you know, they would meet, the group would come together. I think there were hundred members and it, they usually met in a different city uh, and they would have their annual meeting and then they would set up displays and the different members would, you know, show off basically what they had acquired and, um, uh, like an exhibit, really, putting a little, little museum exhibit together. And so he was, you know, as I said, you know, received a number of different awards. He was extremely proud of his collection. And I think as he acquired enough pieces, he would, you know, do different kind of thematic uh, displays around carbines or around different makers, for example, and, and things of that nature. So, yes, he was very active and he was um, acknowledged as a serious collector by a number of these awards. So thank you for bringing that up. Before we started filming, uh, if you could just, just kind of go back to what we were talking about a little bit about how did Greensboro end mm -hmm. up with, with the collection? You know, I, I know he's very proud of it. And you mentioned he wanted to keep the collection together. So I was just mm -hmm. curious in a, in a nutshell, you know, how did the arms collection come here to Greensboro? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I think it's uh, like a lot of things, a little bit of serendipity and um, and timing and um, and who you know, right? So. Uh, Dr. Murphy was in Greensboro visiting with some friends who were also arms collectors and at that time was uh, introduced to the director of the museum, Bill Moore. And uh, so Dr. Murphy, uh, you know, created a friendship, a uh, relationship with the museum director. And uh, when Murphy got to the point where he was seriously wanting to identify a place where his collection could go for the long term, um, you know, I think that the museum was one of the several places he had in mind. And then again, because he wanted his collection to stay together and all of it to be at the same place. Um, you know, a lot of museums, other institutions were not willing to do that. And, and this one was. So those are some of the reasons and some of the, you know, concisely how it is that uh, the collector from Southern California, um, how his collection ended up in Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Gary, if you could just walk down here just for, for one minute. We're about to switch out to uh, yet another collection or part piece of the collection. I just wanted to show the muzzles uh, of these guns and you can see 
again, the different ramrods, we're gonna see the changing of our sights. We're gonna start to see our sights start to change. Well, we're gonna start to probably run out of brass. Um, so they're not gonna be using it as much on the uh, end sight that you would see here. And again, I'm not touching any of this, don't worry. Um, so what you're, what you're looking at is just absolutely a beautiful collection of Confederate arms who are trying to make the best of a bad situation manufacturing uh, in a manufacturing sense because they've now been ousted from New Orleans in April of 1862. Now they have to move on to, to Georgia. And over time, you know, the resources will start to dwindle. Um, and so that's what we're starting to see with this collection. So it's interesting uh, to look at that these pieces, these museum pieces tell us a story. Uh, they're speaking to us without actually speaking to us. So we're going to take another look at the Murphy Arms Collection here at the Greensboro History Museum. We'll be right back. So John, we've pulled out some, some new pieces from the collection. We have four more uh, pieces of Confederate Arms. These are, are carbines. What's a, what's a carbine and, you know, who manufactured these ones that we are looking at here? Okay, good questions. Uh, these pieces are, again, uh, manufactured by Cook and Brother. And uh, to the question of carbine so a carbine is is a is a rifle essentially that's a shortener version and those were especially important for uh men on horseback much easier to handle much less unwieldy um but basically it's a short version of a rifle mm -hmm. so it, to make it easier to wield on horseback what we're looking at here is again what evolution from 61 two three four yes correct. so so as we start to take a look here um, and we have a, a few different versions. What, what I'm noticing different uh, on these, obviously they're shorter. On the reverse side, uh, there's a reverse, and I don't want to touch these. Could you flip one oh, yeah, sure. on for us? Yeah. So I'm noticing that we have a hanger here for the horseback, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're riding along on a horseback, you want to fire this gun and you want to pull out another one, you can actually hook a sling to it and you can drop the gun and it'll start to bang off the side of you or the horse. It'll be a little annoying after time, but it does give you the opportunity to pull out another weapon if you need to, say a sword, pistol, another carbine. Um, the other thing that I'm, I'm noticing, which is interesting, is the ramrods that we have here. How would these ramrods function here, John? Uh, well, I think the innovation with these, especially the 62 and 63, is that uh, they're made in such a way that it minimizes the chance of the person who's loading the weapon from, um, you know, from losing it. So it would slide down like this mm. and then go inside there. And uh, you see this innovation on a couple of different rifles or car and carbines for other makers. But uh, just, you know, if you lose your ramrod, you're, you know, you're not, you're not in business anymore, right? So <laughs> anything to help the, uh, uh, the soldier, uh, you know, minimize his potential losses and be effective in his execution of um you know shooting weapon ammunition etc so i noticed that we have on 63 here we have that uh very innovative ramrod we don't have that innovation here in 1864 we also on this one and this this could just have changed over time but it possibly we also don't have the area where you could put that sling onto it. So it looks like almost we're, we may be running out of the parts that we need or the raw materials. Uh, I, it's speculation probably. Um, but John, these are fantastic pieces here. Uh, could you stand one up for us just so we can yeah, kind of get the idea about the height on it? Yeah, you can see compared to the other one we looked at, it's considerably shorter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and obviously it's much lighter uh, in, in weight as well. Yeah, and, and you can effectively hit someone with, a, depending on what carbine, at about 300 yards. These are not repeating rifles. There are differences between carbines, muskets, rifles, rifled muskets, um, and repeaters. These are single shot, muzzle loading, meaning that you load it from uh, the business end of this gun down to the breech. You're not seeing any breech loaders, which would be a load from the rear or the breech of the gun, the back of the gun. Uh, so you're not seeing that here. So these are a great, great piece of the collection. Now, John has promised us some local Greensboro connections. So we're gonna take a look at those, swap these guns out for more really awesome artifacts behind the scenes at the Greensboro History Museum. Check out their website and be sure to come here in person where, when you're in the triad area. Uh, what we're looking at now, John, looks like some local 
uh, arms. Uh, can you walk us through what, what we're looking at here from the collection? Yeah, so uh, I've pulled uh, examples of Piedmont made rifles. These are all pieces that were made in uh, Guilford County or neighboring counties. And many of them were, um, well, they're interesting. Each has their own story, but several of them, in fact, were um, you know, originally um, makers of uh, hunting and sporting rifles and also associated with Quakers. There's a large Quaker population uh, that settled in Guilford County and Greensboro, and they were you know, very much pacifist during the war. So, But I'll, I'll talk about that as, as well as we go through these pieces. So we've got five different examples of Piedmont rifles that were made uh, during the Civil War. The first one is a piece that is manufactured by Mendenhall Jones and Gardner. I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Mendenhall stands for Cyrus P. Mendenhall, and he was a uh, well-respected businessman and actually was also uh, the mayor of Greensboro at a time. So he and these two other gentlemen uh, uh, pooled their resources uh, to manufacture this weapon. So I believe this one's stamped with their initials, North Carolina, and I'm not sure what else you can make out. Could you make out a date and above the SC or? 1863. Okay. And it looks like CS to me. Yeah, I believe that's correct. So this has got, um, as you pointed out on the other rifles, this is also a muzzle loader with ramrod um, and markings on the lock. It's got the two brass bands. So I noticed at one point it had the attachment where you could attach the, the side bayonet. It looks like it had been broken off, which is easy enough to do with these. Mm -hmm. the, um, How they were attached. Yeah, exactly. And if you did stack arms, if you had the ability to stack arms whenever you make them look like a, a TP uh, mm -hmm. in the pictures, um, it, it's very easy to snap your sights. Any reenactor knows if you, you have to trust someone with your next gun to put that into the stack and you interlock them, it's an easy way to snap off uh, off either your sight or that side piece. I also notice on all of these guns, except for the top carbine, the very rudimentary uh, either rifling or the rudimentary and difference in the um, ramrods. Uh, it almost looks like someone took a, a bolt or a nut and put on the end of this this first one. Uh, as we move up the line, these are more indicative of um, ramrods that would be used in a smoothbore. Uh, very, again, rudimentary. We almost have the, the rifling on this gun, which might be a little bit hard to see. It almost looks like it's hexagonal um, and, and same up on, on this end. So it, it's interesting to see that these uh, locally made guns, they're doing the best with what they have. Mm -hmm. uh, what else do we have here? Okay, so then um, moving away from the Menhol awesome. Jones and Gardner, we have a, a rifle made by H.C. Lamb and Co. And this is a uh, another piece that was made. Uh, Lamb family was in the, I believe, was in the rifle manufacturing business uh, for some time. Uh, I believe they're out of High Point, and I'm not sure if there are any markings visible on the lock plate or not. Let me get that out of your way. Are you not, able to? Not make... that I see. Okay. And the markings on, on the lock plate are important to, you know, the government at the time. We talked earlier about serial numbers. This is every uh, gun that's handed out is actually owned by the Confederate or the United States government. So whenever you hand it out to a soldier, they're going to mark down in a ledger, usually in triplicate, who has that gun. Um, and sometimes when you're very lucky, you might be able to uh, be a, a collector, purchase one of those guns, and then actually figure out what soldier carried that weapon throughout the American Civil War. We've seen some of that in earlier videos when we visited Gettysburg National Military Park. So check out some of our videos with their uh, behind the scene collections with Berdan Sharpshooters. Good. Okay. And then this next piece we're moving on to, this is an example of a Clap Gates, Clap and Gates or Clap Gates and Company. Uh, rifle. And again, I don't think that there's anything on the block plate either that would tell us. No, but it's beautiful. Yeah, the the, the grain it's on there. a lot of these stocks are just absolutely beautiful in the finish. And this is not brass, unlike the first two, right? This block yeah. plate looks like it's iron. It looks like it looks like it's iron. It looks like they're they're making do with what they have. It, it's mm -hmm. it's also interesting that you have, uh, you know, this you know, kind of semi-rounded rear breech here, and then it gives way to, um, 
the actual rest of the barrel. I have seen, at least in, in smaller guns, where they've actually, um, you could unscrew. It's very rare, these are usually homemade things, mm -hmm. where you can actually unscrew the barrel. Um, it looks like this is actually all one piece, but that is something that you do see sometimes uh, that's prevalent in pistols. Yeah, and I think that's also true for the lamb. It's, it's, I don't know if it's octagonal, but it's, mm -hmm. right, is that, isn't that similar? Although Very it extends, similar. extends a little bit further down the barrel. Hmm. Now I'm ex most excited for this last one. This is, this is the one that I have been waiting for uh, since John pulled this from the Greensboro History Museum collection. What is it? Let's, let's not unveil it yet. Let's talk about it for a sec. Okay, so um, yeah, so our last piece will be a piece that actually has ties to Greensboro. Um, not many of these were made. It's a carbine as opposed to the rifle. So again, that's a shorter version of the rifle, typically used by men on horseback. And it is uh, Jeremiah Tarpley, or Tarpley Garrett and Company, um, applied for and, as, and was awarded a Confederate patent, which is kind of unusual as opposed to the U.S. patents. Many of these um, weapons, Morse and lots of others, were recipients of patents by the U.S. government. But so Tarpley... Um, came up with this rather unusual, kind of peculiar, definitely an eye-catcher kind of design that's uh, missing some of the more traditional elements, like a four stock. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, um, it's also in a way rather innovative because it's the first breech loader that we're seeing today of all the pieces that we've looked at so far. Yeah, so a breech loader is a gun that can be loaded at the back of the gun, also known as the breech. Uh, you see John is exposing the, the area where you can uh, place your cartridge in there. And this looks like it would have been a brass cartridge. This could take a, a brass cartridge, correct? I believe that's correct, yeah. yeah this is um, interesting that he points out that there's no forestock. What is the forestock? That is actually this piece of wood that runs underneath the barrel. <laughs> you might not think that's important, but if you've never shot a gun before, you're dealing with explosives and you're dealing with flame. So the more you fire these things, the hotter metal gets with fire. So without a forestock on it, you better have a glove or you better figure out you could wrap a sling around it uh, because this barrel is going to get real hot and you're going to burn your hand very fast. Um, this one may or may not have, uh, seeing here, now looking a little bit more closely, it almost looks like it could take a percussion cap and it could I take... I think it did, yeah. It, and it could um, take kind of like a sharps. Uh, a paper cartridge putting putting in the rear there but this is not a repeating rifle you're not going to load this thing and fire seven 14 rounds this is a one shot deal reload every time and it's it's also interesting here on the the breach where just how wide um here we are in the breach it's showing 1863 it's very well stamped yeah so that's the patent i was referring to earlier from the confederate um government and this one you can see we we're talking earlier about serial numbers so this one is stamped in multiple locations uh, with the same number, which would tell you that that is the serial number that all of these pieces are, um, you know, original to it and um, assigned to it as opposed to being replaced later or or something of that nature. So just wanted to, so here, here it again, the number appears. I'm sure if we look closely, we would see uh, at other locations as well. So again, this is a carbine, so it would have been, uh, had this on the tap, this has been on the back so you could wear it uh, around your shoulder or whatever so as not to, to worry about dropping it or reloading it. Fantastic. I have been involved with this <laughs> collecting since I was a kid. My father and mother, they collect a lot. I have never seen that type of gun up close. I've only seen it in the books. Mm. Uh, so John, we really appreciate you bringing that out mainly to show me, but also to show the <laughs> you, Chris. <laughs> our viewers uh, on our, our channel. So again, you can come out to the Greensboro History Museum. We're going to explore a little bit more of it because we're seeing behind the scenes, but there are these guns on display as well through the Murphy Collection. Hey everybody, we're back at the Greensboro History Museum and we've actually moved into the public side of the Greensboro History Museum here in Greensboro, North Carolina. And we're going to take a look at the temporary display uh, right now of the John and Isabella Murphy Confederate Long Arms collection that they have here at the museum. They're currently refurbishing the exhibit. Uh, you've seen behind the scenes. Now we're going to see what's on display here. Uh, John, uh, I'm going to take Gary right over to you. I'm noticing we have just a wall 
of awesome Confederate arms. We, we start with muskets, moving down to carbines. We have smooth bores where you can see um, the, the different ends of the smooth bore for the third, uh, third band versus the third band at the top. Pretty neat thing. So you wanted to talk specifically about the Morse carbine. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I'll just back up in a second and say, so this is not a temporary display. This is our permanent display, but it is in a work in transition. So the first section, we're going to talk about some of the technology and some of the design innovations. And that's why I thought it would be important to talk about Morse um, as we have several of these pieces. Uh, people may or may not realize um, Morse was quite an innovator and applied for many patents. Wasn't terribly successful financially, but introduced a lot of ideas and technology that was very important uh, in terms of future developments, later developments. And so what we have on display here is one of his breech loaders. And again, we're talking about the breech loader is a piece that's loaded here rather than at the end of the muzzle or the barrel, excuse me. And, um, and in addition to the Morse, and so I want uh, this is open because I wanted people to see how this would be raised up and loaded. And then you would close this uh, before firing it. Um, and in addition to the Morse uh, and <clears throat> carbine, we also have, which really unusual, is an uh, example of his um, centerfire uh, metallic cartridge that was used in this specific weapon. So we've got the Morse carbine, the, um, the ammunition, the cartridge, and then also a, a brass bullet mold that would have been used to melt the lead to shape that. So there are a couple of different um, breech loading pieces in here. Here's the tarpley again that we saw earlier, and you can see other examples of Sharps uh, and S.C. Robinson, where pieces are raised and lowered in order to insert the ammunition. So you're, what you're seeing is, as John pointed out, these are innovative. This is the evolution of arms to what we see coming up here today, where uh, these, again, are not multi-fire uh, carbines. We're not going to be putting in seven bullets to any of these and just starting to, to fire like we think of today with semi-automatic weapons. These will be single shot. So every time you're going to have to reload it, and that is going to force you to take aim another time, which is actually an interesting concept because most people think of fire superiority, just keep firing down range. But during World War II, the Americans talk about uh, using their M1 carbines where they can fire eight shots. All you have to do is pull the trigger as fast as you can. The Germans pointed out who had, who were using uh, carbines of themselves, Mausers, for instance, uh, which were lever action, uh, or I'm sorry, which were bolt action. Uh, and they would have to eject a, bull, uh, eject a bullet, put a new one in every time and re-aim. They said that they had thought they had better accuracy because they had to re-aim every time rather than the Americans who had fire superiority just firing down range. So that is actually something to take into consideration when you start thinking about these, these arms. John, what else do we have uh, here in the collection? So is, is, we're going to be talking about stories. Uh, yeah. So far way down the wall. Yeah, so the second section is really about um, individuals, personal connections to specific weapons. So starting at the top, you see a blank stock, and then, and then below that you see a completed uh, weapon. What's interesting about this piece is that we are fairly certain we know uh, the individual who carved these stocks, and um, this was an African American who was a slave, who, whose name was William Finley, and he worked for Dixon, Nelson and Company, the maker of the weapons, and um, in fact still has you know, relatives that are still around. I think it's great grandchildren at this point who uh, uh, we were able to get in contact with and, and verify some of this information. But so we really wanted to show, you know, this is the raw, crudely shaped stock that then becomes this part of the weapon, the barrel and the stock together and the story of the African-American from Alabama who um, uh, created these pieces um, or worked to shape the stocks for a number of pieces for the Dixon Nelson and Company. Um, the next one we have down here is, is Morris and we talked about him a little bit earlier uh, and then below that is again this is a Morse uh, carbine but what's interesting about this is the story and it's incredibly hard to read but this is finely engraved into this brass part of the, <clears throat> the weapon here. And I've, I've made a transcription, which I'll read because it's impossible to read it, even in this blown up uh, photo reproduction. It says March 1, 1865, company is K, G and K, Massachusetts Infantry, by a night march surprised 
near St. Stephen, South Carolina, a squad of Georgia cavalry who had followed Sherman's army from Chattanooga to Savannah. This carbine was captured in the fight by Captain Char Charles C. Sewell. And here's a photograph of Sewell and a little bit of, so he was a Harvard graduate. He survived the war, obviously. But um, so a number of pieces that were Confederate made were captured by Union soldiers and uh, you know taken as war souvenirs. Some of them have plaques on them. Some of them have engravings. I would say that's a relatively small percentage of the collection the, of the Murphy collection. But you know some of the most interesting stories are those that are literally attached to the piece. So you can then go back and do further research and learn about that individual and verify their story or learn more about what happened to that person after the war. So, um, so that's the story with uh, Charles Sewell. It's interesting in here, um, John, we were talking about, you know, the evolution of this display, which I was incorrect, I'm sorry, this is a, a permanent display in here. Um, what we're seeing here is, you know, the differences uh, in the views of, of the weapons. Um, you know, some of us look at it from a technological standpoint. Some of us look at it from the human standpoint, some from a geographic standpoint. So it's interesting how one piece can tell the larger story uh, of either an individual, of perhaps an armory, or even a regiment, um, depending on, on who is armed with what type of, of weapon. So I really appreciate you, uh, John, opening up these cases for us here at the Greensboro History Museum. And it's not just weapons. If you're not into weapons, you can come down here and learn about Dolly Madison. They have an awesome display over here. You can learn more about Greensboro's history, um, which is a long history from 1808 all the way up through today. Um, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse took place in 1781 um, at the edge of Greensboro, the city of Greensboro. So you can learn more about that as well. So John, we really thank you for opening up these cases here uh, and sharing your stories at the Greensboro History Museum. Oh, my pleasure to do it.